Welcome back. This is lecture 17, the Middle and Late Byzantine Empire, the second lecture on the Eastern Christian Roman Empire. So again, we've seen the uh, essentially the fall of the Western Empire. We've seen the rise of the Eastern Empire, which is very much the Eastern Orthodox religious approach. We're now moving into the later dynasties of the Middle and Late Byzantine period. The images that are made during this period do have more believable dimensionality within the figures. And so we're moving closer to the styles of the Middle Ages and what will perhaps become the, what we might refer to as the proto-Renaissance, the images that start to suggest where the artists are going to begin to make changes um, that will lead us toward the Renaissance itself. The Theotokos at Hagia Sophia is deceptive on this screen. It looks like she's rather small. She's actually 16 feet in height. Uh, there, of course, is quite a bit of damage to this image. She was one of the images that was made after the uh, building was constructed. And of course, there are portions of the uh, decoration there that are very highly damaged. Some have been removed. We also, of course, begin to see that at uh, later points in the history of Hagia Sophia that uh, as it's repurposed into a mosque, that images are removed and changed and replaced. But we can get a sense of what the style of the middle and late Byzantine period really is. When you look at the way that the highlights are handled on the robes here, we do sense a little bit more of a believable figure underneath those garments. We definitely have churches of different uh, configuration. We see them being built throughout the Eastern Empire. This is one such example that comes to us from Greece from the first quarter of the 11th century, the early 10 hundreds. The Church of the Dormition in Greece is one to recognize the interior of in particular, but you see that it forms essentially a cross shape that is supplanted by a dome, and it's this decorative element within the dome that I think you'll recognize probably the most uh, distinctly. It is clearly the older bearded Christ, still with a halo. The initials that you see beside him are in fact the first and last letters of the name Jesus and Christ in the Greek alphabet. So you see that he is being identified for you, not only by visual image here, but also by uh, symbolic verbiage or letters. This is one of the more remarkable examples from Church of the Dormition. It is an example of the crucifixion quite clearly, but you can see that the emphasis here is not on the reality of the anatomy of the body so much as communicating the meaning of the story and the image here is very, very clear. We see the blood from the wounds, so those become very obvious to us. We see the blood flowing onto an obvious memento mori, a reminder of death as well. The Middle Byzantine style is found outside of the bounds of the Eastern Empire, though in other places, the art of Venice is very heavily influenced by the Eastern Empire. In fact, Venice didn't really uh, function as a major city during the heyday of the Western Roman Empire. And it is very much a crossroads. It's a place where multiple cultures come together. And so this uh, particular structure you're at here is very much built in the Byzantine style. This is the Church of St. Mark. It is, in fact, the uh, relocated burial place of the relics of the body of St. Mark. He, in fact, died and was interred in Alexandria, and the Venetians led a successful crusade there, took back the uh, relics and brought them to their own city and, and established his burial site here. So you can see that this heavy use of gold background, the symbolic form of the bodies, the use a very heavy and prominent use of the domes is very much part of the Eastern tradition. So it exists in Greece, it exists also in Venice, as well as throughout the Eastern uh, Empire itself. In fact, the uh, 
church of St. Mark just of five domes altogether over the central crossing area, the church itself forms essentially a Greek cross very much in the Eastern tradition with a dome on each of the four uh, arms as well as over the main crossing. This is the altarpiece of St. Mark's, which again is very different from what we've seen in the traditions of the Roman Empire. We start to see almost cartoon-like repetitions of some figures. These angels seem almost to come from a repetitious stamp, and we've seen that kind of use of repetitious poses and forms quite frequently throughout the uh, iconic, uh, the icon paintings of the Eastern Empire. But you can also see that certain forms and positions become very much symbolic in this form of, of art making. You most likely would not be able to read if you were a member of this congregation. And so recognition of the stories through easily readable visual symbols would really be a central and important part of your religious upbringing. This is the dome mosaic in St. Mark's. You can see Christ is ascending toward heaven. And again, that heaven is represented by a blue field with stars. And he is surrounded by Mary and angels and apostles. And again, that dome rests, if you can see here, there's not a ton of light coming through on the side, but you can see these openings are windows. So this is very much in Venice, but a repetition of or imitation of the style of the Eastern Empire. We also see it happening in the introduction of the Eastern Orthodox Church into the Russian Empire. So really beginning with the marriage of Anna, who is sister of the Eastern Emperor Basil II to a Russian prince, as that marriage takes place, we can see the influx of Eastern Orthodox architectural tradition, religious tradition, and image making all throughout the uh, Russian Empire as well. Here's the Byzantine influence seen in Sicily. And again, it is very much based on the same type of art form that we've seen up to this point. We see very easily to recognize symbols now. You should be able to start to recognize various characters within the history of the Christian church because of the way that they're dressed, the way that they're posed, even the colors that they wear and the gestures that they make. There's no question that you can see Christ here and his role as the creator of the world. One image that really stands out as quite different comes from a little bit later in the uh, Byzantine uh, story. We have the introduction of what we call the iconoclasm or the iconoclastic era. This begins under Emperor Leo III and he essentially makes it illegal to have graven images. There was an enormous conflict between people who believed that the images were useful in communicating the story and helping people to understand the liturgy and those who felt that people were worshiping the images themselves, and not the figures that were represented within them. So the iconoclasts really began to object to the making of images, the use of images. Many images were completely destroyed, removed, taken away, and it is on really a lengthy period until about 842 when we begin to see the reintroduction of imagery. And as those new phase of images, image making happens, there's an increased attention to the emotional side of the story. And so you can start to see that really clearly here in this Lamentation fresco. This is a really interesting uh, painting from Macedonia that gives us a sense of, again, a plain church on the exterior, but still in the Eastern style that's elaborately decorated within with figures who seem not only to be um, telling us the, the importance of the events, but are doing so in a way that also calls us to feel their anguish and their sorrow as they lament over the dead body of Christ post-crucifixion, 
prior to the entombment, obviously, and the resurrection. You definitely, in the late Byzantine period, can see really the roots of the Italian Renaissance beginning to happen. You can see some of the same concerns that Italian Renaissance artists are going to have in this work uh, that you see here from the late Byzantine period. This is the Anastasis Apps fresco from the Church of Christ in Cora in Constantinople. It is obviously well after the era of iconoclasm. We can see that Christ has uh, gone on a mission in this image. He's actually broken the gates of hell, shattered the chains, and removed the coverings of the sarcophagi that house Adam and Eve. You can even slightly detect the figure of the devil below here. He's in a little bit darker skin tone, and you see him in chains, keys and broken chains and the broken doors surrounding him. You see the figure of Christ grabbing Adam and Eve, not hand in hand, but grabbing them by the wrists as he actively restores them. The belief system, of course, is that the figures were unable to enter heaven. Anyone who had died prior to the birth and resurrection of Christ. And so as he returns, he is removing souls from limbo to take them with him to glory in heaven. The mandorla referenced earlier, of course, is the nimbus that surrounds the figure. It acts sort of like a bodily halo, a more oval shape or an almond shape. And we also have uh, referenced the inclusion of the initials here in the Greek alphabet the first and last letters of the word Jesus, the word Christ, are often used to help identify the figure. You can see that there. One of the um, images I want you to be aware of is this particular icon, Christ as the Savior of Souls, from the late Byzantine period. You can really see a difference here from the style of icon painting that we saw in the early Byzantine period. There are more uh, attention to the dimensionality of highlight and shadow on the uh, robes that he's wearing, but especially shadow and highlight modeling the face. The hand becomes a little symbolic. There's still a little bit of obsessive uh, decorative inclusion of multiple folds in the fabric, but it's beginning to look a lot more three-dimensionally believable. And we see that increasingly in the late Byzantine art style. You can see the fabric being pulled against the announcing angel's knee and thigh. We're really getting to the period where we're going to start to see the beginnings of what will be the Renaissance when we get to Italy.